Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. We at the Sufan Center are delighted to be able to host this event in partnership with the permanent missions of Germany, Norway, Tunisia, and the United Kingdom to the UN. And we are looking forward to an opportunity once again to, to do this kind of thing in person. I know I miss sharing coffees and, and margin chats uh, quite a lot and look forward to a chance to get back to that. But for now, we're online and it's a great pleasure for us uh, to be able to host you today. My name is Noreen Chowdhury Fink. I'm the executive director of the Sufan Center. For those of you who don't know, the Sufan Center is an independent nonprofit um, center offering research, analysis, and strategic dialogue on global security challenges and foreign policy issues. Today's event follows on a webinar we hosted a couple of weeks ago, which focused on countering terrorist narratives, examining lessons learned from the past two decades focused on Al Qaeda and ISIS, and their applications to countering narratives of violent far right groups and their transnational networks. For today's webinar, we turn to the question of terrorist financing and consider how the policies and frameworks developed over the past two decades, also largely with ISIS, Al Qaeda and their affiliates in mind, how these can be adapted to address the threat posed by violent far right groups, if indeed they can. Moreover, we hope to identify if and how UN entities can play a role in addressing this threat, given that many of the, the sanctions and CFT measures that are developed through the UN space um, are largely targeted at Al Qaeda and ISIS. Our team at the Sufan Center has been analyzing the transnational violent far right and white supremacy extremist threat since 2019, in addition to our consistent research on Salafi jihadist groups. We have shared our findings through policy reports and publications, briefings to governments, media, practitioners, and through a range of analytical tools. On our website, the Mapping in Security Project has a resource library that collects all of our various briefs um, and reports in one place, so consider it as a one-stop shop for countering violent far-right extremism. As terrorist groups over the past few years have grown, it's highlighted the threat um, posed by individual or small groups of self-activated terrorists, to quote the recent Rusi report, with smaller or different kinds of financial transactions associated with them. And it leads to questions about whether the CFT tools that we've developed can continue to apply. On a broader scale, there are questions about whether and how it's possible to engage through the, the sanctions, the CFT measures that have already been developed through the UN and address the kind of far right groups we are seeing, which are far more diffuse than Al Qaeda or ISIS. So we are looking at a very different type of organizational setup. Following on these webinars, the Sufan Center will be producing two policy briefs to inform the deliberations of policymakers and practitioners, and particularly as member state representatives in New York are negotiating the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy Review and the forthcoming mandate renewals for the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate and the 1267 Monitoring Team in the Security Council. But with that, once again, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. We look forward to the discussions. I know I will, because now I get to pass the mic to Jason Blazakis, our senior research fellow at the Sufan Center, who will be moderating the panel here today. Jason, it's all yours, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Um, wonderful to be here with everybody with such a fantastic set of panelists. Looking really forward to hearing Tom, Sue, and Jessica's remarks today. But before that, just a, a few housekeeping things. This event is going to be recorded for our internal records. However, only missions and panelists' remarks will be shared online publicly. The moderated discussion and Q&A session from you all, the audience, will be closed and will follow Chatham House rules. We will take questions from the audience for this event at the end of the event, so if you can please enter your questions into the Q&A function tab at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address them, in addition to those that have been submitted in advance of this meeting. So the first thing I wanna do actually before introducing the speakers is to allow for some opening remarks from our event partners. And I first wanna offer the floor to Barrett Heinz, who is the head of division for international cooperation against terrorism in the German federal office. And then I will also introduce 
um, his colleague from the United Kingdom to offer a few remarks as well. So Baron, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jason. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, as the co-host of this event representing the German Federal Foreign Office, I'm delighted that so many guests are joining us today. I'm particularly grateful to Jason and to our panelists who are taking the time to share their expertise and experience with us. My special thanks go to the Sufan Center that is organizing today's event. It might be of interest to you that last year, the Federal Foreign Office published a study analyzing transnational connectivity of right-wing terrorism and violent right-wing extremism, which is available on the website of the think tank Counter-Extremism Counter Project, CEP Germany, that conducted the study for us. The study also takes a first look at the financing of right-wing organizations and actors in Finland, France, Germany, Sweden, the UK, and the US. Your friends, past experience has shown that right-wing terrorist attacks do not cost much. The Halle assassin used a 3D printer to print his own weapons, and the Charlottesville assassin drove his car into a crowd protesting against right-wing marches. The costs for both attacks were manageable. However, to draw people under the spell of right-wing ideologies, considerably more money is needed, money that can run the propaganda machinery, money that pays for the organization of meetings. We need to know where this money comes from, where it goes, how and by whom it is used, and what we can do to stop the cash flow. Regrettably, the financial operations of the transnational violent right-wing extremist movement remain under-researched. Too often, the movement continues to be erroneously viewed as a self-financing entity in poor financial shape. Whereas the financial activities of the Islamist extremist milieu have been well scrutinized and well exposed and are therefore better understood, more research is needed to further analyze the various online and offline financial activities of the transnational violent right-wing extremist movement and to adequately account for the money circulating in the milieu. This lack of analysis might be attributed to the erroneous impression that violent right-wing extremist groups are mainly fueled by contributions or donations from their members and therefore do not necessarily need further financial scrutiny. However, it seems that this assumption is only correct as far as individual perpetrators of attacks are concerned. They regularly self-finance their preparations and attacks. But it would be incorrect to generalize this example as representing a typology for the overall financial operations of the wider transnational violent right-wing extremist movement. Additionally, the study mentioned earlier demonstrated the lack of available raw data concerning the financial activities of violent right-wing extremist actors. And where these data exist, there is an analytical gap between the data and a structural understanding of the overall financial structure overlying these activities. An international and cross-authority effort is needed to counteract the financial machinations of the extremist right-wing scene. Our conference today is an opportunity to take a closer look at how the extremist right-wing movement finances its activities. And I hope that it will serve as a starting point for closer cooperation between us, the participants. I wish you all an interesting conference and I'm looking forward to exciting, thought-provoking presentations and discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Baron, for kicking us off with really um, important observations regarding this threat. I think it's a, a great way for us to start conceptualizing what the, the panel may dig into later, later today. Um, I also now want to give the floor to uh, Kingsley Green, one of our uh, co-sponsors for this event, who is the head of the Counterterrorism and Extremism Network in Europe for the British Embassy in Brussels. Kingsley, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to Bernd for, for opening that. I'd like to 
echo his thanks to the panelists, um, to the Sufan Center uh, for organizing this and to my fellow uh, colleagues from Germany, Norway and Tunisia who are helping to co-host this event. Um, the UK is committed to tackling the terrorist threat associated with violent far-right groups. Um, and over the past few years, as you, Jason, have already mentioned, we have been increasingly concerned by the scale of this threat and how it's increasing. In the year to April 2020, a quarter of CT arrests in the UK were associated with right-wing terrorism. These stats are a little dated, but they are reflective of the threat picture we see today. And some of you may have seen the recent reports into the arrests in the north of England linked to an investigation into right-wing terrorism. But this is not just a domestic problem. There is significant transnational connectivity between far, violent far-right groups and clear international connections observed between UK-based actors and international counterparts. As another example, over recent years, the UK has prescribed several right-wing groups, including last month the prescription of Atawafan Division. All of these groups have or had a transnational footprint. In order to cooperate effectively to combat this challenge, we need a shared understanding of the risk. And this includes, importantly for today's event, how these groups and individuals finance their activities. The similarities and differences between this activity and other forms of extremism and what is happening online. I agree with Bernd's analysis that there is a gap in our understanding here. And the only way we can close it is through international cooperation. Like other terrorists, Right-wing terrorists employ low-tech, inexpensive, we inexpensive weapons to conduct their attacks, which they fund from personal income or other uh, low-cost means of generating finance. As this is the case, I think it's important for international governments to focus on financial intelligence to aid investigations and disruptions. And I'm interested in the role of counter-terrorist finance tools and measures in this context. The UK has a strong legislative framework which criminalizes the financing of terrorism in all its forms. The UK supports the Financial Action Task Force as the main body setting CTF standards, and we encourage states to implement FATF standards fully and effectively. We also encourage others to adopt effective public and private partnerships with non-profit organizations and the financial sector to address this threat. I really welcome the opportunity to listen to the discussion today. I think it's incredibly important and the insightful um, recommendations of the panelists will be taken on board by the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kingsley, for those remarks. And thanks to the United Kingdom for taking such strong action um, in the context of trying to counter right-wing organizations. And now I want to pivot to our panelists. And we have a fantastic set of panelists today, all of whom I've been fortunate enough to um, cross paths with whether I was in government or outside of government. First, I'd like to introduce Jessica Davis, who is the president and principal consultant with Insight Threat Intelligence. You know, before uh, taking on this role as president and the head of Insight Threat Intelligence, she was um, in the Canadian government um, and her career in some ways I see as parallel to, to mine. I, I was in government and I started my own consultancy um, and Jessica had worked before um, becoming um, one who is engaged in the private sector in the uh, Canadian government, where in the beginning, um, she worked on intelligence analysis issues for the Canadian military. Uh, she's worked on policy issues for Global Affairs Canada, um, and she has worked in Canada's financial intelligence unit, FinTrack, and of course also has worked in the Canadian security intelligence service. I'm, I'm trying to think where, where Jessica has not worked within the Canadian government, and I'm having a tough time uh, imagining where that could be. Um, maybe RCMP, perhaps. But um, great, to, great to see you, Jessica, and great to have you on, on this panel. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts today. Now, I also want to introduce um, Tom Keating. Um, Tom is the director of the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute. I've worked with Tom quite extensively, both while I was in government and now outside of government, thankfully. And it's really good to, to see you, Tom. Tom's research focuses on matters at the intersection of finance and security, including the use of finance as a tool of intelligence and disruption. And I think, uh, you know, given that and what Kingsley just mentioned, 
um, regarding the importance of financial intelligence. I think both Tom and Jessica are really well positioned to talk about the role of intelligence today in the context of countering the um, financing of the, the far right. And then our third panelist today is Sue Ecker, a senior advisor at the International Peace Institute, leading a project on safeguarding principle of humanitarian action at the United Nations 1267 sanctions regime. She works with the World Bank on issues related to de-risking and the unintended impact of AML, anti-money laundering and countering financing of terrorism measures. She is also um, teaching at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and is an adjunct senior fellow at the Washington think tank, the Center for a New American Security. There's so much more I could say about Sue, Jessica, and, and Tom, their bios are uh, rightly extensive, but I want us to jump into the substance of today's talk. And first, um, as I mentioned up top, we're going to offer Sue, um, Jessica, and Tom each eight to 10 minutes to lay out some overarching observations regarding this issue of um, terrorism finance tools that could be used against the financing of the far right. And I like to kick our conversation off with Jessica Davis. And Jessica, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much, Jason. And uh, thank you very much to the Sufan Center for this excellent uh, invitation to such an important event. So to kick things off, I wanna start by saying that I'm a big proponent of evidence-based policymaking. So when I think about countering the financing of far right groups, I have two basic questions that should, in my view, guide our analysis. First is what's worked in the past. And the second is how are right-wing groups different than the types of groups that we're used to countering? So to tackle the question of what's worked in the past, there's actually a really simple, if unsatisfying answer. We don't know. <laughs> countering terrorist financing policies and practices have been ill-defined and their effects and outcomes have been poorly measured, if at all. In fact, we haven't even really settled the debate about what counter-terrorist financing is meant to do. Is it meant to stop the flow of funds to terrorist groups, which is a pretty vague objective? Is it meant to reduce levels of terrorism globally, which is a pretty big objective for a rather narrow set of activities? There's a lot of different answers to this question in both the academic and practitioner space, and the answers matter because it affects how we measure our progress and determine what works. So while I can't answer that question today, I can help frame this discussion by, by more precisely outlining the different policy approaches to counter-terrorist financing and how these may apply to a greater or lesser extent in terms of countering the financing of right-wing groups. Most of these that I'm gonna talk about today have been applied to groups that we're familiar with like Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, LTTE, et cetera. I'll leave aside for now the issues of the unknown outcomes and focus on what the approaches are. So the first one that we're all really familiar with is the criminalization of terrorist financing. This is a global standard and requires states to adopt laws that make it illegal to finance terrorism. But that actually is applied quite differently across jurisdictions and what financing is actually defined as differs considerably. The second approach is the intelligence pro approach that Kingsley was talking about. So this really uses financial intelligence to detect and disrupt terrorist activity, which may be go beyond just financing activities. A key component of this approach is the development and exploitation of financial intelligence. I also want to signal that financial intelligence isn't just produced by banks or financial entities. Human, SIGINT, in fact, most of the INS have some component of, can have some component of financial intelligence. It's the content, not just the source of the intelligence that matters. The military approach to counter-terrorist financing uses kinetic means to disrupt financing. Obviously, the application of this approach is rather limited. It involves capture or kill missions of key financiers, the destruction of cash storage sites or sources of terrorist financing. The financial exclusion approach relies on sanctions and other means of financial exclusion to prevent access to the financial system. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about sanctioning or listing groups. The approach can be multilateral or unilateral and has varying degrees of impact. The regulatory risk approach, which we're all going to be familiar with as well, builds on the anti-money laundering approach and uses the private sector to help mitigate the risks of terrorist financing. It requires financial entities to report mandatory and suspicious transactions and cooperate with law enforcement security 
security services while managing risks in their institutions. And having worked at Canada's Financial Intelligence Unit, I can tell you that the regulatory approach is a bit of a challenge in the terrorist financing space. And there's other two other approaches that I want to flag. There's the technical assistance approach, which seeks to enable less developed jurisdictions to implement many of the above approaches to counter-terrorist financing, and the civil law approach that uses lawsuits as a means of reducing terrorist ability to fund attacks and their organizations and seeks to deter terrorist actors. So very few of these approaches are applied on their own. Instead, most states use a mix and match strategy based on a number of factors like their domestic and political contexts, their perceived risk of terrorism and terrorist financing, and of course, international pressure. So which of these tools or approaches are most appropriate to countering the financing of far-right terrorism? So I think the important thing to flag here is that these tools were really designed to counter terrorist organizational structures. So groups with defined leadership, perhaps financing committees, state sponsorship, et cetera. These tools and policies were designed in an era before cryptocurrency, financial technology, social media platforms. That's not to say though that they haven't evolved. In fact, some of the most innovative work has had to take place in the counter-terrorist financing space to counter the rise of lone actor terrorism, including the use of financial intelligence to understand the mobilization to violence process. But these tools or how they are applied have perhaps not kept pace with some of the developments in global terrorism. Most address that aspect of group financing, but only a few can be adapted to counter operational activity conducted by cells or individuals. And that's even more of a problem for countering the financing of technologically adept, but nebulously structured far right actors. In the far right or with ideologically motivated violent extremists, as I tend to prefer, because far right doesn't quite capture the full spectrum of beliefs that we encounter today, or really accurately describe that ecosystem, there's a lot of daylight between organizational or ideological financing and operational financing as Byrne described. Many ideologues or movement leaders receive large amounts of money from identity-based support networks, often generated by online activities. You know, Think about their YouTube channels, live streaming on Twitch, DLive. In some cases, they also get large donations from wealthy donors, some of which may be tied to states. But in many cases, while these individuals espouse hateful views, extremist content, they may not actually be breaking any laws in a lot of the countries where they're operating. So while we can advocate for them to be deplatformed, including financially deplatformed from payment providers, for instance, many of the tools in our toolkit are difficult to apply to these individuals. It becomes something of a game of whack-a-mole. That's not to say though that that's ineffective. So much of counterterrorism is about making a prospective terrorist or extremist life more difficult, being more persistent or diligent than they are until they either make a mistake and cross a criminal threshold or abandon their mobilization plans. Both can be effective, but it's usually the former that gets the media attention and is frankly the most satisfying for counterterrorism practitioners. When we think about counter-terrorist financing and operational activity for ideologically motivated violent extremists, much can be learned from our experience countering lone actor jihadis. While our current sort of suite of extremists can and do engage in activity in a coordinated manner, they also engage in a lot of low complexity self-funded attacks. These are often more challenging to detect and disrupt than cell-based activity because there's less opportunity for leakage and bystanders to notice what's going on but they can still be detected and disrupted with careful and diligent investigations, the use of financial intelligence, and frankly, a little bit of luck. In my view, the big difference, so finally answering that second question, uh, of between today's motivated violent extremists and our old familiar terrorist actors is a source country or region. Neo-Nazis, white supremacists, anti-government extremists, and a host of other violent ideologically motivated actors are present in the West. They have bases of support in our countries. They may have affiliations with legal, albeit extreme political parties, and they operate with relative impunity. They take advantage of our laws supporting freedom of expression to promote hate and violence. This also means that they finance themselves in our countries using our economies, developing identity-based support networks in our communities, diverting their benefit payments to advance their causes, and generally making use of our relative wealth for organizational and operational financing. Their base of support and their areas of operation for attacks is essentially the same space. 
and many of our countries are actually exporters of extremist ideology. Our counter-terrorist financing tools have mostly to date been applied against an enemy from afar. So the question remains really at this point, how do we turn that lens inward? So as a final concluding thoughts, I wanna highlight a few areas where I think that we may have some cognitive blind spots in our analysis of right-wing financing. So the first is that distinction between operational and organizational financing as Bernd so eloquently outlined in his opening remarks. This is a really critical com component of counter-terrorist financing today. There's also a lack of precision around what we mean by financing. Are we talking about raising funds, moving them, financial tradecraft? The umbrella term financing can be useful at a really high level, but its utility declines when we need to think about precise policies to counter specific activity. The third element that I wanna highlight is the role of women within the extreme right. Historically, women have been seen as peripheral to terrorist activity, but in practice, they've often played key roles in financing and logistics, and of course, in attacks. And my final flag to everyone here is the myopic view of counter-terrorist financing as being largely about one or two of those seven approaches that I outlined earlier. In fact, we have a pretty robust toolkit. We need to find the right combination, and perhaps get a few new tools here to counter the financing of ideologically motivated violent extremists. So that's all I have to say about that for now. Uh, I'll turn it back to Jason, thanks. Thank you, Jessica, and really great question. How do we turn that lens inward? And I think that's a harder question for some countries to answer than, than others. I know in the United States, it's been particularly nettlesome given a, a series of issues surrounding how we tackle um, terrorism in general in the United States, domestic versus international. But one country I know that has done much better in turning the, the lens inward and for quite some time is this is the country in which Tom is based right now um, in the United Kingdom. And I, I love to turn the floor over to, to Tom Keating from Rusi for some of his opening remarks. Tom, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Jason. Yeah, and depending on who I'm talking to, I'm either carrying a British or an Irish passport. So uh... I, I can be a chameleon in these post-Brexit days. Anyway, look, thanks very much for inviting me. I mean, there is, I think, a, a, a serious risk that I violently agree with, with, uh, with Jess and indeed with what Noreen was saying. So I'll try and pick out some of the points that um, I perhaps make, which are uh, uh, additive. But just to kind of situate where we're coming from at, uh, at RUSI. So uh, as you said, we, we look at the intersection of finance and security and the focus because on financing of terrorists and other forms of extremist activity is core to what, what we do, and indeed, Jason, what, what we've done together in, in recent um, times. Uh, and I think it became clear to us about three years ago that um, as we were doing, and I, I see that um, in the audience, uh, our former colleague here, Florence Keane, is, is, is with us, who left us to go and do more study on the extreme right. But it became clear to us when Florence and I were doing a project on responses to terrorist financing, um, the, the thinking around uh, terrorist financing had become very kind of one track. It had become very focused on doing the right thing in order to meet the expectations of the Financial Action Task Force. Um, and that, of course, means um, you know, implementing sanctions and, and, and all of that. And what was pretty clear was that that approach probably wasn't uh, really achieving what had been originally set out to, uh, to to achieve. And so it's worth just dwelling a little bit on on, uh, on on history. And the kind of the recent history is, of course, as we all know, that the, you know, the foundational Security Council Resolution um, 1373, it didn't make any specific mention of the form of terrorism uh, in its operational uh, paragraphs, and it applied to both you know, persons and and entities. But of course, the background, 9-11, uh, uh, meant that it inevitably was linked to jihadi-based terrorism. Now, for you mentioned that, that I'm from the UK. Of course, in the UK, uh, the concept of terrorist financing wasn't, wasn't new. Uh, you know, my, my father is a former military officer who served in Northern Ireland, and, and he knew a bit about uh, non-jihadi uh, terrorist financing from, from that experience. And indeed, you know, the UK had been dealing with that, and some of, I think, the smartest minds on terrorist financing cut their teeth in that um, environment in, uh, in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. But 
the, the obviously the direction of travel after 9-11 was to think about jihadi based terrorism and therefore how are those groups, importantly, uh, those groups financing themselves and obviously other opinion forming and norm setting organizations like the FATF followed suit and perpetuated the sense that counter terrorist financing was counter jihadi terrorist financing. Um, and, you know, not not surprisingly, and, and that's not something that I would um, I would uh, criticize, but of course. That means that most countries have set themselves up to look at the terrorist financing uh, issue as, first of all, a threat that is group based uh, and secondly, a threat that is um, jihadi uh, focused. And so when uh, terrorist or extremist issues, and we'll come on to the distinction in a second, but when those issues come up uh, and they're not um, uh, group or jihadi focused, then I think the system has difficulty uh, adapting. And that's certainly something that we uh, we witnessed in in the UK in in uh, in 2018 when we first started looking at uh, this um, this issue and and again as Jess said um, the result is that what has grown up is a system that kind of requires uh, an organisation or a person to be designated as a terrorist before uh, in the eyes of the law most of the legal powers that are used by law enforcement uh, are are unlocked and so you then come to this dance between, well, what is a terrorist? What is an extremist? Where is that line? And as you say, I think in the UK, the, the British Home Office has been more forward leaning than in many places and has been kind of willing to start making those, uh, those, um, th those designations and, and as a result, resources and uh, focus follow. But what that means, I think, is that because uh, in many places that distinction is not made, then of course we have to consider other uh, disruption um, activities. Um, so just a, I think one thing we should talk about is this issue, this definitional um, issue. So there is clearly um, a gap that needs to be considered that the need for articulating a more robust legal definition of, of extremism uh, and a greater willingness of governments to engage at a strategic and political level um, with that debate. And it's a debate that in the UK, we sort of had uh, a few years ago, and then the government backed off from it. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really sure where that debate is at the moment. But I think we do need to have some clarity uh, here, because it's very difficult, and I'll come on to the private sector in a second, I think it's very difficult for those charged with trying to combat the extreme right and the financing elements of it to address that when they don't really know um, where they stand on the um, on the the legal uh, spectrum. So we, we wrote, um, Florence, myself, and, and a colleague, Kayla, we wrote this article for the Rusi Journal, uh, which was published in 2019 and got way more attention than, uh, than I, was, I was expecting. But you know, we looked at how these actors were financing themselves. And guess what? You know, very similar to what you would see uh, on the jihadi side of the spectrum, legitimate earnings, government benefits, petty crime, fraud, perhaps a bit more use of uh, online tools, um, crowdfunding, social media, uh, cryptocurrencies have their appeal for their kind of libertarian uh, tendencies, um, but also some perhaps some differences. So the sale of merchandise has been covered a lot, so group related paraphernalia, um, membership fees, ties. So some things that we don't necessarily see uh, in, the, in the jihadi space, but fundamentally I think where we are on this is that if we try and take the traditional framework, and I think I'm supporting what Jess was saying here, if we try and take the traditional framework, we're really not gonna get very far. And this is where we come back to this whole concept of financial intelligence and the value of finance as an intelligence tool, as a networking tool, as a tool for identifying vectors of disruption. And I won't go into that anymore because Jess has covered that. But I just wanna say a point on the, the private sector. Um, as the as the ex banker on the call, um, you know the private sector is on the front line uh, of responding to a range of criminal threats. You know, given the industry's exposure to the proceeds of those crimes or the role that um, the industry has in moving money from where it's raised and stored to where it's need to be used by terrorists and other threat actors. And yeah, you know, clearly it's true that the private sector needs to take uh, its responsibilities seriously. I do worry that difficult issues, and I think addressing the, 
the, the extreme right and other forms of kind of non-jihadi extremism fall into this category. Difficult issues risk being outsourced to the, the private sector by government agencies and policymakers, because we all know that the private sector has a very, very low tolerance for reputational risk. So that can be harnessed. I think, you know, if you let it be known that there are individuals who are distasteful, but not necessarily crossing a legal line, well, of course, um, it's tempting for that to be a shortcut to, uh, for, for governments to basically get the, the banks to do the financial disruption um, activity. And I was, I was struck, obviously I sit an ocean away in, in the UK, but I was struck by some of the media coverage after the Washington DC riot, insurrection, uh, whatever term you want to use uh, in January. And there was one story that caught my attention in which a large US bank was accused of actively but secretly engaging in the hunt for extremists in cooperation with the government and without the knowledge of the consent of its customers, et cetera, et cetera. So this was an accusation uh, leveled at a large American bank uh, by the Fox News presenter, um, Tucker Carlson. And he basically accused the bank of effectively acting as an intelligence agency. Now, Tucker Carlson obviously doesn't understand the Bank Secrecy Act. He obviously doesn't understand the requirements put on financial institutions to report suspicious transaction reports. He obviously doesn't understand how Section 314A of the USA Patriot Act works. But nonetheless, I think it does bring to the fore a question, which is that we do need to, obviously the private sector has a role to play, but I do think it's important that we don't leave the private sector to be on the front line uh, in, in this case. There are examples in the UK of PayPal closing down the accounts of obnoxious individuals um, as, as well. So I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop there with, with one last thought actually, which is that we've just passed, I believe, the second anniversary of the Christchurch call which has been heavily focused on efforts to eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. I would like to see something like the Christchurch call um, uh, put in tandem with some thinking about financial connections. Although we refer to these as domestic threats, they are, in, they are increasingly connected transnationally and that connection uh, can be financed. And so I think what I wouldn't want to see is us to, again, overlook the financial side of this um, in favour of purely looking at the, the messaging and all the rest of it, important um, though that is. So that's something I think we can perhaps discuss a bit more, Jason, when we get on to the, the Q&A, but I'll, I'll stop there uh, and pass back to you. I'm going to be really tempted to ask you questions about Tucker Carlson now after uh, your intervention in reference to, to him, Tom, and and really appreciate your your opening remarks. Um, made me start thinking when you were referencing your your family about the fundraising carried out by Northern Irish Aid and in the United States. And I really want to pivot and ask that question, put my professor hat on, um, but I'm going to have to refrain from that. Um, now it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Sue Eckert to hand over the floor to, to Sue. And I'll just say um, Sue's book, The Countering of uh, Financing of Terrorism is a, a book that I assign to, to my students when I teach my terrorism finance class. So it's wonderful to, to hear from um, Sue, and Sue, the floor is yours. Jason, thanks very much. Uh, that's getting a bit outdated. I think we need to update it uh, because it was some time ago. But let me begin by first thanking the Sufan Center and uh, in particular, Jason and Noreen for organizing this session because I think uh, this is a critically important time uh, now, 20 years with experience and trying to counter the financing of terrorism is a great time to consider what we have learned and how it might be applied in different ways. So I just want to touch upon uh, a couple points and, and amplify or, uh, what Tom and Jess have said, because I think they've really covered the, the waterfront very well. Um, that what's undoubtedly true is that since 9-11, we've really witnessed an impressive global effort to disrupt financial support for terrorism. And what we have now is a countering the financing of terrorism regime. We have it in the context of UN Security Council resolutions. We have it with refined standards by the FATF. Uh, and it's been quite a significant effort. 
and I think what's really notable is that there have been innovations over time. And here I think that uh, the UN Security Council has modified these measures more than a dozen, uh, through a dozen resolutions. There's been adaptations and learning um, and uh, pr new procedures. For example, there was criticism about some of the procedures not being transparent enough. The Security Council responded. There was the notion about uh, you needed more detailed criteria for listing. There were statements of case, public releases of listing information, periodic review of designations. All of these things were changed over time. Um, perhaps most remarkably is the Security Council in 2009 actually established an independent and impartial ombudsman person. This was in UN Security Council Resolution 1904. But this is important because this is to whom designated individuals may directly appeal their designations and request delisting. And the reason why this is important is because that there were legal challenges to the 1267 um, sanctions. And uh, I think it's, it was notable because these legal challenges were actually causing some states to be reticent about putting forward names because they were subject to challenges in national and regional courts. And it put um, member states in the very untenable position of either fulfilling their security council, their resolution, uh, their requirements under the UN charter um, and breaching uh, domestic law. So these changes uh, have taken place. Some were due to external pressure, particularly the legal challenges that I noted, but it's really, I think, notable that the 1267 sanctions regime has demonstrated an impressive institutional development and ability to change over its two decades. But so what do, what do we know? Not lessons yet, but just what do we know? It takes a small amount of funds with which to carry out terrorist attacks. The means by which terrorist finance activities now has changed. And as Tom and Jess both noted, they largely consist of criminal means within a state, uh, cash, self-finance, criminal activities, theft, extortion, uh, taxation when they're in control of uh, geographic areas and new things such as cryptocurrencies. But the point is that the, the countering the financing of terrorism regime still largely remains focused on the formal sector. Um, but terrorists don't necessarily use financial institutions for transfer across borders now. So uh, when, the, when we set up the regime 20 years ago, it was primarily established with the challenges of, of um, not set up with the, the challenge of smaller scale domestic terrorism in mind. It's important to note, as Tom and, and Jess both have talked about the organizational nature of Al Qaeda uh, and the successive range of terrorist groups to which the 1267 regime applies. The, another point, detecting terrorist financing for financial institutions in everyday transactions is really difficult. Um, it's hard to distinguish um, and some would say impossible, but, um, because they, but it's only that inf the information that we derive by combining what the financial institutions know with what governments know in terms of the intelligence community, law enforcement, uh, the FIU, that when you combine those things, information um, with regard to trends may be discerned. And I think that it's very important here because it allows governments to be able to identify perhaps specific patterns or actors that may be involved, but, but the financial institutions aren't going to see that on their own. Um, and in that regard, then governments really need to increase collaboration between the private sector and government law enforcement and intelligent agencies. Now, with regard to right-wing terrorism, um, as everyone has noted and our distinguished representatives of governments, this is really a serious and growing threat, uh, right-wing terrorism. Uh, and it's not just about domestic action, but it is about sort of the, where these flow over borders into international uh, initiatives. But addressing these also to some extent poses a challenge for some states. For example, the US does not designate any organizations as domestic terrorist organizations, largely because doing so may infringe on First Amendment protected free speech. Um, but there are some things that, uh, you know, that can be done and I think are being looked at 
One is recent changes with regard to beneficial ownership uh, can help in identifying some of the uh, supporters. But I think what it is important as the UN Security Council thinks about what it can do to address is to reflect on the lessons that have been learned from international CFT efforts. Um, and we'll get into this, I think, in some of the Q&A, but, but I want to uh, pose, and I have not uh, thought about it in great depth, but I recall back in 2004, following the Beslan attacks uh, in September by the Chechen separatists, that the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1566 in October 2004. I've not thought about this in great depth, but one might consider uh, that as an opportunity to look at how some measures could possibly be expanded and focus on right-wing extreme extremism. Another point I would just say in, in concluding here is I think it's really important to assess effectiveness of these measures because the nature of the threat uh, you have to take that into account and the changing nature of the threat in order to assess the appropriateness of the response. And I would suggest that we've really not had a critical uh, reassessment of the fundamentals of the, the countering the financing of terrorism regime in, uh, and that now might be an opportune time. The 20th anniversary of 9-11 as noted uh, is coming up. It provides an inflection point that we might take advantage of in terms of reviewing the development of the global CFT regime and to assess whether or not there are changes that can be made that will address current uh, terrorist threats more effectively. And I, I wanna thank Tom, Jessica and, and Sue for their work today um, on this uh, panel. Amazing observations. I, I really appreciate your uh, candor, your your observations, and uh, the very well-made points you made throughout this uh, discussion related to terrorism finance and the challenge of right-wing financing. I, I want to turn the floor over now to one of our hosts for this event um, from the government of Norway, John Christian Muller, who is a counselor for the Norwegian mission at the United Nations. So, um, John, if you're available, um, love to see you turn your uh, video on and to uh, help us wrap this uh, conversation up. Thank you very much, uh, Jason, and uh, thank you for the floor and uh, the opportunity to, to give the closing remarks on uh, behalf of the permanent mission of Norway. Uh, I must say we are very proud to, to once again have been uh, co-hosting and um, such an important uh, side event with uh, the Southern Center. So uh, first, I want to just thank you for organizing this uh, this event. Uh, it's been, I mean, tremendously interesting to listen to uh, to the panelists uh, here today. Uh, so uh, as many of you will know, uh, the two terrorist attacks uh, Norway suffered during uh, this century were uh, both carried out by uh, persons motivated by right wing uh, extreme ideologies. Uh, one of these uh, terrorists uh, killed as many as uh, 77 people. Uh, many of them were uh, participants at a youth camp. Uh, youngest person was only 14 years old. So the attacks in Norway were carried out and self-financed by so-called loan actors, uh, and they were not facilitated economically by others. But I mean, this doesn't mean that it will not happen in the future or excludes the risk that such financing may involve Norway in some way. And this is uh, absolutely a threat the Norwegian government takes uh, very seriously. Uh, in our uh, uh, national uh, risk assessment from uh, December last year, uh, the bank's ability to adapt to increasingly diversified risks for instance, uh, detecting uh, terrorist financing to extreme right-wing groups is uh, identified as a vulnerability. Uh, the risk assessment further states that the extreme right movements in Norway have international networks, including with uh, cross-border financial uh, transactions. So for the banks, it may be more difficult to uncover these transactions. As, uh, as the money is not transferred to you know, known conflict zones. Uh, so furthermore, it's, it's a known fact that uh, extreme right-wing movements in Norway uh, ask for donations in, uh, in virtual currencies 
and as a topic that have been raised uh, during this meeting is, uh, is legally banning right-wing groups. And we see that it's, it's challenging. Uh, although some countries are now seeking ways to, to ban the most extreme and violent organizations. Likewise, uh, detecting uh, suspicious transactions and ultimately prosecuting the financing of uh, right-wing terrorism uh, may also prove to be, uh, be difficult. Uh, having said this, uh, we very much welcome increased knowledge about how right-wing extremists uh, might be funded, as this will uh, absolutely make us better positioned to tackle this uh, in the best possible ways. And uh, our common goal must be that all forms of terrorism, including all those motivated by right-wing extremism, are prevented from uh, raising funds to commit terror. So uh, uh, we'll just end this with saying that today's discussions have been extremely fruitful and uh, we definitely look forward to following uh, the development of uh, this very important work. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Muller, for your remarks. And I think it's a, a really good way to, to end this conversation is to reflect on the, the self-financing and micro-financing associated with, with this movement and how to... Um, take on that challenge because it's a, a significant challenge. It, it's, it's a challenge in which uh, governments are going to have to um, work together on, um, not just through the lens of what's happening domestically in their country, but also um, through the lens of multilateral and bilateral cooperation. So thank you for your remarks. And I also just want to reiterate my thanks to the panelists today for a wonderful discussion. And again, to uh, express my thanks um, for our event partners, um, the governments of Germany, Norway, United Kingdom, and Tunisia, um, and for all of you today who have come and joined us, um, and for your, your excellent questions, and I apologize um, for being a, a poor moderator and not getting to all your questions that were in the Q&A tab, and um, if you do have a, a question that you really want to answer, I would recommend um, emailing the Sufan Center, and we can do our best to try to get you a response for those questions that we were unable to answer. And thank you all again for coming today and wish you all a great um, day, evening, um, afternoon, no matter where you may be.